Today I want to talk about some work with Dan Greenwald and Martin Letow, and Dan is here as well to participate in the conversation. So in this paper, we are after a very simple question, why do stocks rise and fall? And surprisingly little academic research has been devoted to uh, addressing this question directly. In asset pricing, we've mostly focused on how expected returns vary in the cross-section or over time, and say at shorter frequencies. So in this paper, we take a longer view and we are considering what are the economic forces that have driven the entire stock market over the post-war period, and, and not just the expected return component of that. So some basic empirical facts help to motivate our investigation. The stock market has risen sharply in the post-war period. This has been driven mostly by the last 30 years. And here are some statistics for the US um, corporate sector. And what you see is that from 89, the beginning of 89 to the end of 2017, which is 29 years, the real value of market equity for the US corporate sector grew at more than four times the rate of the previous 29 years. By contrast, the real value of what the sector actually produced shows the opposite temporal pattern. So output growth was much quicker in the earlier subperiod. And if you look at corporate earnings, now the pattern flips again, and we see the corporate earnings growth was much higher in the earlier sub, in the most recent subperiod compared to the earlier subperiod. So what's the upshot of all of this? Well, it's a widening chasm between the stock market and the broader economy, which can be seen in this plot where ME stands for the total value of market equity for the US corporate sector. And here we've plotted three different ratios of ME, market equity, to three different measures of aggregate economic activity. And you can see that it's at or near a post-war high in all cases. Notably, market equity relative to earnings for the corporate sector is not near a post-war high. Okay, so what is then responsible for the sharply rising equity values over the post-war period? Now, it doesn't seem like um, you know, broader economic growth is attributable to that, as textbook economics teaches us. Okay. So how was the wealth won? Well, for that, we need a model of how equity is priced. And so in this paper, we will construct and estimate a model of the US equity market. Now, by definition, the imposition of a model means that we're imposing some structure. However, our approach is intended to allow the data to speak as much as possible. And we do this by estimating a flexible parametric model of how equities are priced that allows for influence from several mutually uncorrelated latent factors. And then we infer what values those latent factors must have taken over the sample to explain the data. The identification of mutually uncorrelated components in a log linear model means that we can precisely decompose 100% of the market's observed growth over the whole sample or at any point in time into distinct component sources in the model. And then we apply this model to the US corporate sector over the period 1952 Q1 to 2017-Q4. So here's a brief outline of the model. We have a representative firm and there's two types of agents in the model. There are workers and shareholders. Workers are hand to mouth households that consume their labor income. They don't own any assets, so they won't play any direct role in asset pricing. Shareholders should be thought of as akin to a wealthy household or an institutional investor that finances consumption entirely out of assets. Domestic output has this functional form, and here AT is a mean zero TFP shock, and this is what will drive fluctuations in aggregate economic activity in the model. N is a labor endowment, hours times a productivity factor. Uh, workers inelastically supply labor, but labor productivity grows at a gross rate G, as, as does uh, capital. As, as well. So these grow deterministically. Now some earnings accounting. Um, <clears throat> a fraction tau of domestic output is devoted to taxes and interest and a catch-all other in the NIPA accounting framework of charges against uh, corporate earnings. The remaining one minus tau is divided between labor compensation and domestic after-tax profits. Total earnings, E, also includes retained earnings from firms, foreign subsidiaries, so let's denote that some fraction F of Y. So we'll write total earnings as a fraction S of Y and S itself um, is you know, governed by the domestic profit share SD, T is the, the one minus tau piece and F is the foreign earnings share of, of domestic output. Okay. 
So here's labor compensation. It is a share one minus SD of after-tax output. One minus SD, we will refer to as the domestic labor share. So to summarize, S, the earning share, moves inversely with the domestic labor share, with the tax and interest share, and positively with the foreign retained earning share. So what is this S? Well, it is modeled here as an exogenous factor share shock. It's a reduced form way of capturing changes that may occur for any reason in the allocation of rewards to shareholders. Now, the labor share component of that, the domestic labor share, is the quantitatively largest. Possible sources of variation in this include changes in the industry concentration structure over time that alters the labor intensity of production, or changes in the bargaining power of US workers, which itself could be driven by changes in international competition or the prevalence of unions, offshoring practices, et cetera. And then there are technological factors that could be playing a role, which you know, changes in technology could alter the substitutability of labor for capital. And then of course we have the earnings from overseas affiliates and taxes and interest playing uh, up the remaining roles in driving the factor share process S. So cash payments to shareholders will be modeled as net payout. We'll call those cash flows. And this differs from earnings and net payout is net dividend plus share net share repurchases. So this differs from earnings by net new investment. So a firm will be modeled as reinvesting a fixed fraction omega of output each period. So we're gonna denote cash flow C. And so this is what cash flows would be in that case. This reinvestment is needed to achieve the long-term growth and output at the rate G. Now, this is just a simple way of capturing the empirical fact that firms in aggregate retain part of their earnings for investment and that this required investment depends on Y rather than on the earnings share. Okay, so in the equilibrium of this model, there will be a representative shareholder, not a representative agent because workers play a role in aggregate consumption. And this representative shareholder consumes aggregate shareholder consumption, which in equilibrium will be aggregate net payout. Now, the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution of shareholder consumption is in the SDF in this framework, and that's going to take this form. Okay, so we put in red two parameters here. This preference shifter X and the subjective time discount factor beta vary over time. These are modeled as externalities and taken as given by individual shareholders and driven by the market as a whole. So X will drive the price of risk in the stochastic discount factor and will affect risk premia. And since an SDF always reflects both preferences and beliefs, we can interpret an increase in X as either an increase in effective risk aversion or an increase in pessimism. And then the time varying beta is essential for obtaining a stable risk-free rate along with a volatile equity premium as we observe in stock market data. So we will pursue a log linear approximation of this model um, that can be solved analytically. And in it, log output growth will be specified as an IID process that's driven by the TSP shock in the model. And whenever you see lowercase letters, those are log variables, the log of the earnings share S, the log of the risk-free rate, the log of the risk price, these are all modeled as Gaussian AR1 processes with low and high frequency latent components, which we'll denote with LF and HF. Now the price of risk will follow this process. And here we've got these separate low frequency and high frequency components. This piece here, which we'll just call the orthogonal risk price component, is orthogonal to the economic state. This is like a pure preference shock that alters the agent's willingness to take on risk. Lambda not equals zero. Lambda is a constant vector with the same constant value parameter lambda as uh, in its arguments. This not equal to zero permits the willingness to bear risk to vary with the profit share. So this is going to allow for the possibility that rising corporate profit shares have been associated with a greater willingness to take on stock market risk over time. I just want to point out that restricting this parameter to be zero would not be appropriate given the data because the log earnings share is positively correlated with valuation ratios like the price earnings ratio for the corporate sector or others like the crisp PZ ratio. It's really impossible to explain this fact with lambda equals zero since the transitory increase in the earnings share would be negatively correlated with the log price earnings ratio in the model in that case, and a permanent increase would be uncorrelated. 
So lambda will be freely estimated with flat priors and a principal could be zero if the data want it to be zero. Um, and we do estimate a separate version of the model where we restrict it to be zero to get a sense of the role of this piece. So we're gonna confront the model with data on output growth, the earning share and logs, that's gonna be EY, a proxy for the risk-free rate of interest and the price to uh, the market equity to output ratio for the corporate sector, PY. We also use a measure of the risk premium implied by options data and it's this Ian Martin's SFIX measure to help discipline our estimates of this risk price. The risk-free rate is just measured as the three-month T-bill minus um, a fitted value for inflation from regressions on lagged inflation. And then observations on one, two, and four are all for the U.S. corporate sector. So our estimation of the parameters is done with Bayesian methods, but under flat priors. We have seven latent states that we need to estimate. One's the TFP shock that drives aggregate economic activity. And then we have the low and high frequency components of the earnings share the real interest rate and the orthogonal risk price component of the equity premium. So since the model's linear in logs, we can simply use the Kalman filter to estimate this. And we use uh, you know, Bayesian methods to characterize uncertainty about parameters and latent states. So let me show you quickly some parameter estimates and latent state estimates. So here are the modal parameter estimates. I'll just point out a few. First of all, the effective mean risk price, think of this is like effective risk aversion. This is quite modest. And this reflects the volatility of cash payments to shareholders. So we don't need outsized risk aversion to explain a high equity premium. The persistences of our state variables are key to understanding what drives the market according to this model in the long run. So here's the persistent, the error coefficient of the low frequency uh, risk-free uh, risk rate piece, so the real interest rate. It's about 0.93. And all I wanna point out here is that what this means is that the substantial declines recently that we've observed in the real interest rate do not rationalize anything near a permanent shift. And that's going to be important. We'll come back to that later. But the persistences of the low frequency factor share component are higher um, and as well as the orthogonal risk price component. Now, what does this negative value for Lambda that we estimate mean? Well, it means that rising corporate profit shares have indeed been associated with the greater willingness to take on stock market risk over the sample. Okay, so let me show you um, some latent state estimates. Now here, here's what we have for the earnings share. Uh, you know, credible sets are known to be wide in estimations with flat priors, and that's also true here. But I just wanna emphasize that the sum of the high and the low frequency components always adds up to the observed series without error. And that's because we have a flexible enough model um, to explain these data exactly. Okay, so what you can see is that the low frequency component of the earnings share that we estimate, it captures the longer term swings in the actual earnings share, which is in black. And the higher frequency component is picking up mostly these cyclical um, movements that you see. Now, what about the risk-free weight? Well, the first thing here, notice that the actual risk-free weight rate is in black, and you see that the real interest rate is very low today, uh, or at the end of our sample in the end of 2017, but not unusually low. It's been uh, low or lower earlier in the sample. So, you know, and then we see it shoots up under the Volcker disinflation, but this low, high, low pattern that we observe in the post-war data is well captured by the low frequency component of the risk-free rate, which is coming from this uh, preference parameter here. And then there's a high frequency component that's picking up um, some weeks. Here's our estimate of the risk premium. The only thing I wanna point out here is, and then we overlay it with this, this three months SVIX um, um, version of the risk premium from options data. It's only available for sub periods. But what I wanna point out here is that our estimated risk premium, a latent state variable, you can see that except for this big spike in the great financial crisis, the equity premium, according to these estimates, has been declining steadily for decades and is at a record low at the end of our sample. Okay, skip that. All right, some asset pricing results. So I wanna show you some moments from the model and the data. Now here, the model numbers are from repeated simulations of the model at the modal parameter values. The fitted numbers use our estimated latent states obtained from fitting the model to historical data, our historical sample. Therefore, the fitted moments 
are the implications conditional on the observed sequence of shocks in our sample? The fitted moments, therefore, are the ones that are directly comparable to the data moments which are based on our sample. All right, the fitted moments of the earnings share, excuse me, the earnings growth, the log earning, the growth in the log earnings to output ratio and the risk free rate match exactly the data moments. And that's because, as I said, we've used these as observables and there's no measurement error in our measurement equation of the space based representation. The fitted moments for things that we haven't targeted, like the log equity return, the log excess return, and the price payout ratio also match the moments reasonably well, given that they weren't an estimation target. However, the fitted mean excess return understates the data mean by some because the model understates the mean of payout growth over the sample, and we see that here. That was not an estimation target. Now, the fitted mean log excess return of 6.6% is greater than the model mean log excess return of 3.7%. That's by 2.9 percentage points. Why is that? Well, that is attributable to an unusual sample with a long string of factor share shocks that has redistributed rewards to shareholders. That can be seen by noting that the fitted means for earnings and payout growth are larger than the model means. Now, going back to the model mean excess return here, that, what does that reflect? It just reflects covariance with the stochastic discount factor, that is risk. The fitted mean is affected by this covariance, but also reflects the persistent movements in earnings and payout over the sample. So putting this together, what this means is that the estimates imply that roughly 2.9 percentage points of the post-war mean log return on stocks in excess of the treasury bill rate is attributable to this string of favorable factor share shocks and rather than compensation for bearing risk. In other words, the sample mean excess stock return overstates the true risk premium by about 44%. Okay, so I, we have lots of plots of these counterfactual factuals in the paper. I'll just show you one. This is uh, plotting what role does the factor share component or the earnings share component play in the post-war variation in the log market equity to output ratio for the corporate sector. That's the data shown in black here. And what we can see is that if we just look at only the component that's attributable only to the factor share, low frequency component of the factor share, um, shock, um, this is what you would get. And so we can capture these longer term swings in the price payout ratio, excuse me, the price output ratio with this low frequency component. The high frequency component is just picking up some of these cyclical wiggles. And what this shows you is that if we fix both the high and low frequency factor share components at their values at the beginning of the sample, then the model is unable to capture any of the upward trajectory in the price output ratio since about 2000. And if we fix these components at their value in 1989, then only a small portion of the upward trend since 89 in the price output ratio can be explained. And that's just exhibited here by the difference between these two lines at the end of our sample. Okay, this is just showing you what happens if we restrict lambda equal to zero, and that's the green line, and we get uh, similar results and still showing a large role for the factor share component. Let's do a quantitative breakdown now of the growth in market equity over time. That's what this is doing. All of these uh, contributions sum up to 100% of the change in market equity over some period. So what this is telling us is that 43% of the market's rise since 89 and 19% over the full sample is attributable to this factor share movements. And most of that is coming from the low frequency component, which is not surprising. 24% since 89 and 26% over the full sample is attributable to this orthogonal risk price component. And we see a much smaller role for the risk free rate, though not negligible, 8.5%. What about economic growth? Well, that contributes just 25% since 89 and 54% over the full 65 year sample. Now, if you look at the previous sub period in our sample from 52 to 88, economic growth explained more than 100% of the market's rise. 
But as we see here, that was a 37 year period that created less than a third of the wealth generated in the 29 years from the end of 80, beginning of 89 to the end of 2017. So the bottom line here is that the market made far greater gains in a much shorter time from 1989 to present when factor shares reallocated rewards to equity holders even as economic growth uh, slowed. All right. My last slide is just to say, well then what's explaining uh, the movements in the earnings share? And mechanically, because we this is just by accounting, there's just three possible reasons. Either the labor share declined, the tax and interest share uh, increased or uh, declined, or the foreign share of uh, retained earnings has increased. And so what we can see here is that we do a variety of counterfactuals to try to understand what's going on. Basically, it's all labor share, because if we allow only one component to vary at a time, then whether we do that since 1952 or since 89, we can see the declining domestic labor share accounts for the bulk of the rise in the earnings share. That's what's shown here in this blue line. And on the other hand, if we fix one component at a time, right, we can explain little of the run up in the earnings share with whenever there's a fixed labor share. Okay, you see these flat lines here. That's what we would be left with if the earnings share were fixed. Uh, excuse me, if the labor share component of the earnings share were fixed. Okay. The other two don't do much. The tax and interest share is doing nothing. All right, so let me conclude. What have we done? We have asked why has the market risen over the post-war period? To address this question, we have estimated a flexible parametric model that allows for influence from several latent components while inferring the values that those components must have taken to explain the data. What we find is that the high returns to holding equity in the post-war period are in large part due to you know, good luck, at least on the part from the perspective of a, of a stockholder, attributable to a string of shocks that reallocated rewards towards shareholders and away from workers. The realizations of these shocks added about 2.9 percentage points to the mean log excess return, according to our estimates, thereby overstating the risk premium by about 44%. Now, if you look at the 37 year period from 52 to 89, the econo you know, economic growth propelled the stock market. But that was a comparatively lackluster time for equity values, creating less than a third of the wealth generated over the 29 years from 89 to the end of 2017. So the, as Sydney said, the objective of the paper is to explain the evolution of the stock market level. That's clearly an important exercise. For example, the stock market run-up is tightly linked to the very large increase in wealth inequality. And furthermore, the result has clear implications for the equity premium, which is a key input into portfolio choice and the cost of capital. The intuition there, as Sydney mentioned, is that if you have a sample where the average realized equity premium is high, not because investors wanted a high compensation for risk, but, but because there was essentially good luck for shareholders, such as an increase in the factor share, then the true equity premium going forward that you should estimate is going to be much lower than the realized average. So the two main results is that in terms of the evolution of the market's increase, that the increased profit share has been a key driver, explaining about 42% of that increase, and that a lot of the realized excess return on stocks is actually not a risk premium, so, the, so that when you teach your MBAs how to calculate the cost of capital, then you should uh, subtract a lot from that number. All right, so I thought it would be helpful, especially for those not uh, in finance, to just talk through a few multiples to see how the moving parts work here. So think about the, um, evolution of the stock market, <coughs> uh, which here I'm calling market equity. Clearly that's gonna depend on the size of the economy as measured by GDP. And if it was a case that the ratio of the market equity to, G to GDP, if that multiple was constant, well then the market will grow at the same rate as the GDP. You can uh, divide and multiply by a few things to get to the equation here to get some more intuition. So basically the valuation, start from the right, the market equity valuation is gonna depend on the size of the economy how much of the economy is coming from the corporate sector, how much of the value in the corporate sector goes to profits as opposed to labor, and then finally the multiple that shareholders are willing to pay for corporate profits. That's the gray one that's in turn gonna depend on discounting the risk, pre the, the risk premium as well as uh, the market's expected growth rate for corporate profits. So those are the moving parts we have to work with. So the first insight of the, of the paper 
is to just graph a bunch of these different multiples to show you that whether the multiple is constant or not really depends on what you're graphing. So the bad one is market equity relative to corporate net value added. It goes up by more, almost a factor of four since 89. And the gray one scales not by the total value of the corporate sector, but by the part that actually goes to uh, investors, the corporate profit. So that's a gray line. And you can see that goes up a lot less. And the difference between the red and the gray line, that's the factor share, the corporate profit share. And that's gone up a lot. That's really what's driving uh, a lot of these multiples. Here's the factor share for profits. You can see that it's basically doubling since the late 80s. All right, so my first comment here is uh, that it might be more meaningful to study not just the stock market, but the enterprise value, so the whole value of what investors hold. Um, if you think about where corporate net value added goes, it goes to labor, it goes to profits, but it also goes to interest and taxes. And the paper correctly account for that. I mean, they're subtracting things out correctly uh, to study the effect of profit share and equity value. But economically, what happens is that if you have more, if you have less debt, let's do it that way, then you're gonna have uh, that driving uh, a higher co corporate profit share, which in turn, and that's actually more subtle, which uh, in turn affects the PE ratio or the market equity to corporate profit ratio. So in the bottom, uh, the brown line is the interest share. It's actually moving around a bit more than implied by Sydney's pictures we may have to reconcile there. But you can see basically that it's gonna matter whether you study the corporate profit share, which is the green line, or you study the whole share that goes to investors, which is the yellow line. And so in corporate finance, this is a well appreciated point. And so when you do valuation, Generally, what you do is you look at enterprise value, which is the value of both uh, shares and debt. I think actually they don't, this also lines up better with the model, which is about total payout to investors as opposed to capital structure. I vote the same multiples out one more time. This is easy to implement. I don't think it's going to make a huge difference, but from the brown line here, you can see there is going to be some, some parts of the factor share movements that's going to be driven by the share going to interest and other liability payments. All right, so second comment, is to, to get a better sense about what is the profit share really doing in the model. So the authors rewrite their multiples a few more times in order to express them in terms of payouts. That makes sense because not all corporates are, corporate profits are paid out. And then basically what happens sort of in one line is that they write out a very nice model of the market's willingness to pay for payout. That's this blue part. It's going to be a function of the, sort of the Gordon growth model ingredients, the viscous rate, the risk premium, and the growth rate as well then as the payout um, to equity holders relative to corporate net value added. That's basically the same as a profit share, except that you have to subtract out investments. So then lo and behold, you have one equation that you need to in estimate and you need data on all the stuff that this is driven by. And then so you end up having a system of five variables, which they then estimate uh, in a nice way. Now you can see here, I highlighted a few things here in green. So those are all the different ways that the profit share is mattering. Obviously, it's going to matter over here, as you would expect, but it's also going to drive the growth rate inside of the equity multiple. That's just because the profit share determines the payout. So the dynamics of the profit share is going to determine the, the dynamics of payout growth. And then it's also allowed to affect the risk premium, as Sydney mentioned. This actually is, you know, like a little bit shady in the sense that other things uh, could have been driving the risk premium over that period rather than the parking share. So it's possible that uh, you know, there's another element missing from the model. So I would say it would be nice to decompose the main result, the 42%, into the direct and indirect effects. I tried to read off some numbers off of the graphs, and I think more than half of the main result is coming from the direct effect. Uh, but as I said, you want this 2B effect to be small, because maybe you're missing something else to explain uh, that last part. I want to talk a bit about the role of the risk-free rate, because the Prior literature attributes a huge role to, the, of, to uh, fall, falling real rates in terms of stock market valuations. So the current paper disagrees with that. And I think actually the idea is very nice. It's because they, they say, look, in reality, the, re, the risk-free rate, the real rate is probably a mean reverting process. And in fact, the estimated persistence from an AR1 is only 0.93 in quarterly data. So that means if you think about sort of your standard Gordon growth model valuation here, you can think of the RF changes not as permanent, but it's effectively smaller because they're transitory. 
So the prior work, for example, by the authors listed here, instead of assuming the changes in the risk-free rate are permanent, then what happens is because the risk-free rate series goes down so dramatically after uh, 1985 or so, you actually need an increase in equity risk premium in order to, to fit multiples and generate the right expected stock return. And so that's clearly counterfactual. Sydney showed you the, the, the measure of the risk premium from Ian Martin's VIX based measure, which is, uh, if anything, declining. So I think it's a great addition to have this AI1 process for the risk free rate. That said, I think um, we could improve things a bit more in the sense that you need a bias adjustment to the fee just to make sure that it really is substantially below one. A standard adjustment moves it from 0.93 for the long, uh, the low frequency component to something like 0.94 for. Uh, that's going to matter a bit. But I have a, a sort of a more interesting suggestion, which is it's always going to be some, some people saying, okay, maybe this time is different and maybe the risk free rate now is more persistent than it was in the past. You can actually test that. You can test whether a stable process, so a sort of an AI1 with a constant coefficient, leads to a good fit of a survey based measure of persistence for which I'm going to use. Uh, the SPF, uh, the sort of professional forecasters, measure of the expected real rate over the next 10 years. Okay, so what you do here is what you could, you could actually do both of these at the same time. So you assume a value for the, the AR1 coefficient. Based on that, you can calculate a predicted model average just from the AR1 of what the average real real rate or the average real short rate should be for the next 10 years. You just compare that to the survey and you can see if you have the right persistence. If not, you update the AI1 coefficient until these two are close. Okay, so let's take a look. So this is what the AI1 will give for the predicted average real bill rate over the next 10 years as a function of the persistence of the process. You can see basically this is the same as the actual real rate series with the swings just dampened if they are less persistent. Fine. Let's overlay the survey data. That's the blue line. Let me do this one red line at a time because it's hard to see which one fits best, so which fee is the right one. Here's the author's estimate of 0.93. You can see that the red line here is not quite swinging around enough. So the true value is probably his 0.95, maybe 0.96. And you can turn this into an estimation. You're gonna get a number that's not one, but it's probably a bit higher than what the author's estimated. So that means that the role of the declining real rate is going to be a bit bigger than estimated, but probably modestly so. But I think it'll actually help the author's case that these changes are not persistent to compared to the survey data. And once you have the survey going, you can also confirm that actually the risk premium as measured by the survey is not increasing, it's actually decreasing. This is the red line here from the same data. Finally, uh, a word about COVID. So uh, Sydney and Dan has an, they have a nice follow-up paper where they use this exact model to decompose stock market evolution in uh, 2020. They find that it's actually hard to explain what the stock market did during this period because the output drop was not that big and the corporate profit share didn't fall that much. So they say, well, maybe then it's due to risk premium changes. Let me just show you a picture here to wrap up that um, with a co-author, we have actually updated Ed Martin's risk premium data, and here they are. To the left, you can see just a massive increase in the risk premium implied by options. This is the, the one-year risk premium is blue in the left part. It goes from 3% pre-crisis to over 15% in uh, mid-March before falling, not quite all the way back. The, this is the, the red line is a two-year risk premium. So if you, to the right, you take how much the S&P decline of 37% can you explain with the risk premium? just from extra discounting in year one and two, you know, a good bit. And so uh, why did, well, I mean, why especially did it move down so much? It turns out the Federal Reserve announcement uh, on March 23rd had a huge impact on this. So here's a measure just to get into the data. I'm gonna use a VIX exchange traded fund. You see a huge drop right around that March 23rd uh, Fed announcement and it happens right after the, uh, the Fed announcement. So. Um, it turns out actually that uh, the Fed has generally uh, been a huge driver of the equity risk premium. I have some earlier work on that that I'm not going to explain in detail, except to suggest that for those of us working on monetary transmission, I think we need to translate from only thinking about the short real rate to also think about uh, the risk premium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a thoughtful discussion. I open the floor for a few questions.
Um, we have to keep a sort of short because the panel is coming up at the policy panel, which is uh, uh, happening at uh, 11.45 Central Time. Um, so do you ladies have, uh, can unmute yourself and start asking questions? Hi, I'm completely ignorant of this field as you know, Sydney. So let me ask you a very ignorant question. You know, why is it, you know, if you want to think about this as labor redistribution from labor to capital, definitely a lot has happened over the you know, 20 years, 30 years. Um, you know, union share became half of what it was. But I'm surprised that the corporate tax rate is not doing more in your model. The effect of corporate tax, I think, also fell dramatically during this period. And I, it was too fast for me. I thought I saw like a zero attached to that, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, we, we have those in the tax and interest share and um, just relative, I mean, it does move around. Um, and by the way, our data, I think our data set ends before this last uh, Tax and Jobs Act or whatever, but, um, you know, it's just, those are, to explain the whole post-war era, those are just uh, too transitory and too small of wiggles, um, as it turns out. They're just not for if I can just follow up for, for one second, this is Dan, by the way, and this relates to um, a point made in the discussion as well. It turns out that actually the, the interest share and the tax share are like pretty negatively correlated over this sample. So actually either of them by themselves would move a lot more than the, than the combination. So because we kind of lumped them into this other category, the combined uh, contribution is too small. That's, that's part of it. Excellent. Very helpful. I had a question for you, Sydney, about trying to connect this to, to you know, macro. Um, so we typically think of there being a lower labor share because there's something like a Cobb-Douglas production function and the exponent on you know, labor in that function goes down, right? That's what would typically lower the labor share. And then that would suggest that maybe the exponent, I don't think it's that like people got less capable or like there's more diminishing returns to people. Our nature didn't change. It's the capital we're working with, right? So there's some labor substituting technological change going on. So it's like really the capital exponent that's going up. And so what that suggests is that capital has less diminishing returns to it, right? That would be consistent with your story about a, a lower labor share. And that would also increase the equity values of these firms. But that should then correspond with there being larger firms, right? Less diminishing returns means larger optimal size. So then that lead me to, led me to think about you know, is this effect that you're describing um, strongest among the largest firms? And if so, that would be really interesting because we'd kind of tie it together logically. Yeah, I mean, I agree uh, with everything you, you say, Laura. Um, you know, the thing that we have completely sidestepped, sidestepped here is like, what's driving this S? Um, I think, you know, Dan and I have been talking about for years trying to figure that out with a more, putting more structure on it for this paper. Um, we, you know, we, we don't do that. But I also agree that your intuition is consistent with mine, that some amount of that is going on. It just does seem like the stock market, especially is being dominated by increasingly uh, dominant firms that are larger and taking over bigger sections of the economy. I could just follow up on that, Laura. So uh, it turns out that having the exponent on capital get closer to one is actually also a really good way of fitting the inequality facts. And so what happens when the stock market goes up and inequality goes up, it's, it's not only the case that the rich get richer, they also become more cyclical. So the beta basically increases. <clears throat> and that's something that you can get out of a model like that. I have a brief sketch of that in a paper with, in a focus paper with Jonathan Parker. Yeah. 